Begin journey, navigating the road to cyber resiliency. The state of cybersecurity has never been more challenging for organizations. You hear this narrative constantly and people might be getting sensitized to it, but it's true. Organizations are rightly scared because of fear of the unknown, namely, Surprise attacks by increasingly crafty hackers with sophisticated cyber tools. Organizations don't know what they don't know. Look, even if you could prevent all attacks, which you can't, all it takes is one disgruntled or unethical developer with access or a careless or misguided person on the inside to compromise your systems, literally in seconds, and at a scale greater than ever seen before. And the threats continue to evolve. The latest concern to have gone mainstream, of course, is AI. Foundation models like GPT are being used to escalate attacks through better phishing scams, automation, and more. While new techniques can also be used for defense, it seems that hackers are always first to find novel and creative ways to break in. Or, you know what? They're even still exploiting legacy tried and true methods of infiltrating organizations because let's face it, with so many tools, old and new, it's impossible to keep up with the state of the art because you, you can't just get rid of techni technical debt overnight. The point is, there's been an unprecedented focus on greater preparedness for cyber attacks from boards of directors, even now public policy mandates from the government. As such, as our data shows, Cyber resiliency remains at or near the top of organizations' IT priorities. But are we making progress? While some organizations are closing the gap, we have to ask, why are so many feeling less than confident that they're prepared? And what can they do about it? Welcome to Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency. My name is Dave Vellante and I'll be your host of a new cybersecurity series that we're launching made possible by Dell Technologies. Here's the scoop. SiliconANGLE and Dell are kicking off a series of events and coverage on this critically important topic to run through 2023. We'll be bringing together industry execs, subject matter experts, analysts, partners, customers, and more to help drive this discussion with the goal of arming all organizations with the information they need to navigate, i.e. to map, their own route to cyber resiliency. Today, we'll introduce you to the first in a series of three programs. Our fundamental premise is that backup and recovery, sometimes generally referred to as data protection, must become an integral part of a cybersecurity strategy. It's really that simple. You can't protect against everything. You can't predict what will happen next and how severe it will be. So your last line of defense, that is the ability to recover from a breach, has to be front and center on your journey to achieve a zero trust approach. Now we have three segments today. First up is Rob Emsley, who directs marketing for Dell's data protection portfolio of products. He's gonna help us set the stage and put cyber resiliency into context. And he'll also share some data from the Dell Global Data Protection Index. Then we'll hear from Daniel Newman of the Futurum Group. Daniel is a friend of theCUBE and recognized as one of the top market analysts in the technology business. He'll share his perspectives on the market, zero trust, and some of the top industry trends. And then we're going to close with Jim Shook. He's the director of cybersecurity and compliance practice at Dell Technologies. Jim, he's got a background as an attorney and spends a lot of time with customers and boards of directors, helping them to figure out how to reduce risk. And we're going to pick his brain as to how to reduce yours. With that, let's kick off episode one of Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency. Wow, lots of people on the road to cyber resilience today. They know that to supercharge innovation, they need a foundation of modern data protection that includes recovery from cyber attacks. Excuse me, I'm looking for modern data protection. Uh, across any cloud? Yeah, any workload? Definitely. Oh, you're looking for Dell Technologies. Straight ahead, can't miss it. Thanks. He didn't give us a chance to tell him that Dell Data Protection is modern, simple, and resilient, all by design. <laughs> He'll see when he gets there. All 
Okay, we're kicking things off with Rob Emsley, who directs product marketing for Dell's data protection products. Rob, I'm really excited about the collaboration that we're doing, the series, and great to have you back in the studio. Oh, it's great to be back, Dave. I mean, it's been uh, only a few months since we, we did the future of uh, multi-cloud data protection event with you. You know, and certainly, you know, we're really excited by, you know, this engagement that we are kicking off with this inaugural show. Yeah, now, as our audience knows, we've covered many data protection topics on theCUBE over the years. But this topic, it seems to continue to dominate the headlines, Rob. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think you're aware that every year we run a global data protection survey uh, of rough and tough about uh, 1,200 customers around the globe. And one of the things that we've really started to inquire about a lot more in our surveys is the question around cybersecurity and cyber resiliency. One of the things that we found is that two thirds of the organizations surveyed last year uh, are really concerned that they don't believe that their existing data protection measures and infrastructure is sufficient to cope with malware and cyber threats. Also, the same amount, two thirds also believe that in the reality of, of work from anywhere, learn from anywhere, that's actually increased their exposure to cyber attacks. So certainly there's just a lot of concern as far as do I really have what I need in order to protect the business? So it's interesting, because basically you're saying that people are aware of it. So some of these numbers might surprise you a bit when you think about just the sheer number of vendors that are off offering solutions in this space. And as folks know, you know, cloud really doesn't solve the problem. So why do you think we continue to struggle so much? I think a lot of it is because we have a very fragmented security market. I think we've um, you know, sort of seen research that says there's somewhere north of 4,000 incumbent vendors, startups, uh, adjacent players, uh, addressing various points of the security landscape. So we really believe that, you know, the challenges are that, you know, there's just a lot of inconsistency because there's so many solutions that are out there. And that's one of the things that, that we are really looking at here at Dell to try and address by, you know, bringing, you know, our perspective about how you actually navigate through this complexity. Well, and we saw this during the pandemic, Rob, there was so much funding that went in and a lot of that went to cybersecurity. And so people naturally say, okay, here's a tool that's going to solve this narrow problem. Let's, let's try it because we have a, you know, maybe we just got snake bit and got, got hacked and now we've got this new little shiny toy. Yeah. And so 4,000, I mean, that is just an incredible number. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the old adage that uh, in order to solve cybersecurity challenges, you need technology, people, and process. And you really need to be uh, wary of um, vendors that come to you and say, buy this solution and it will solve your problem. You know, I think the reality is that it's a multifaceted challenge, you know, and that's where you really need to, to, to look at, you know, the entirety of the problem, you know, and, and, and break it down into, into into piecemeal chunks that you can address and, and, and build a holistic solution. Okay, so let me set up this sort of next part of our discussion. We have a lot of noise in the market as we just talked about. You got more sophisticated attacks. You got too many organizations that don't have adequate preparedness. CISOs tell us they still have lack of skills inside their organizations. So what we want to do with Rob is we want to go and understand like where do we go from here? And more relevant to our series is what's the relationship between data protection and cyber resiliency? So Rob, how does Dell think about cybersecurity in general? Yeah, well, we really frame the conversation into, into three specific areas. The first you know, is protection. So it's really the, the goal is to stay secure against evolving threats. So that is certainly an area where, you know, all of the work that, that many customers have done to protect their perimeter, protect their infrastructure. You know, certainly if you think about um, some of the techniques within 
um, infrastructure itself, things like hardware router trust, certainly work that we do with you know, our partners like Intel within you know, our data protection appliances, even down to the components that we use. You know, so if you think about things like our Broadcom components, mm -hmm. you know, silicon root of trust becomes really so important. Also, the fact that the infrastructure that you deploy comes through a secure supply chain. You know that we guarantee. You know hasn't uh, has got to you in a, a very secure way. So protection still remains a key element of the conversation. The second one, though, is really where I think this series is going to really focus on, which is resiliency. How do you withstand and recover from attacks? And I think that's where the data protection and the backup and recovery market becomes such a close adjacency to the overall cybersecurity space. You know, backup has been around for a long time, but I think that you and I have discussed how the entire industry is really spending so much more time now talking about how your data protection and your backup and recovery infrastructure helps you become more resilient and uh, allow you to recover from cyber attacks. So those are two very key pieces. And the last one, I think, is a real key element to Dell's message around security is you need confidence. So yes, protection and resilience are great. A lot of that is around technology and process. But confidence really comes from the people that you work with. And one of the great things that Dell's able to provide is a global set of resources that are able to not only help you implement uh, techniques and processes and tools, but also is there for you to respond when you need it. And nobody knows when you're going to need it. But the, the pure scale of global services from Dell, you know, we have many situations where we have been able to work with customers immediately uh, when they need it. You know, and I think that's such a, a key important piece. So protection, resilience, and confidence. You know, this idea, and I'll share, but our audience knows that we've talked about this a lot during the pandemic. So many CIOs told us that their, their, their resiliency, their business resiliency was way too focused on disaster recovery. So when we talk about cyber resiliency, we're talking about being able to survive an attack and specifically being able to recover and resume your critical business operations. Now, Dell's been in the market for a long, long time with cyber recovery so solutions. So my question is, does your solution have staying power in the market? And, and what can you say that gives customers confidence that it's going to get them you know, through the future, this uncertain future that we face? Yeah. So certainly if we go back to our global data protection research you know, last year, you know, one of the, um, you know, the really upsetting facts is that 48% is that of the organizations that we surveyed had actually suffered a cyber attack in the last 12 months that prevented access to their data. So this is you know, something which um, you know, is deeply concerning. I think one of the realities is that um, bad actors are not only going after production systems, but invariably they're going after backup infrastructure. So as you mentioned, then literally half a decade ago, and it was really after you know, the infamous attack on Sony that we really introduced the concept of, of isolation into our backup and recovery solution as a additional layer of security that we could provide to our customers to make them more secure and make their backup infrastructure more secure. So really, our cyber recovery solutions is really focused on three distinct areas. First is immutability, you know, and certainly, um, whether or not you're, you're implementing a cyber recovery vault, immutability nowadays is, is effectively something that you should be implementing across all of your, your backup infrastructure. You know, certainly our backup appliances that have been in our portfolio, as you know, for, for many, many years, you know, have inbuilt security and inbuilt immutability, and they have done for a very long time. But we continue to, to make those systems you know, more highly protected with things like multi-factor authentication, things like very specific role-based access control. So that's on the protection side. And certainly, you would like to think that being able to recover from your, your primary backup copy 
you know, would be, um, you know, your first line of, of, of defense and your first line of recoverability. But over the last six years, we've been supplementing that with this concept of, of isolation. So immutability first, isolation, and then intelligence being, you know, the second two elements of our solution. And that's really where the whole concept of delivering a backup copy, maybe not of all of your data, but certainly of your critical rebuild applications, systems, and the data that they need in order to get you back up and running and make that, that uh, copy of that environment completely isolated from the rest of production, from the rest of your backup infrastructure. You know what I like about what you're saying, Rob, is, I mean, Dell Technologies is a product company, but you're talking about much more than product. It's a, it's a wider scope, the, the supply chain security, you know, you know, not just a single point product. You're talking, the services are a key piece of it. You kind of alluded to that earlier. I really appreciate you helping us set up this, uh, this series and, uh, and, and episode one, really appreciate it. You're great, thanks Dave. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, keep it right there. We're coming back with Daniel Newman, who was voted the number one independent market analyst. You're watching Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency. Hey there, need any help? I was trying to help these customers track down their critical data. Let me guess, cyber attack. I'm afraid so. And they're not very confident all of it can be reliably recovered. Oh man, we're toast. Oh no. Well, I'm not surprised. 63% of IT decision makers share their concern. The good news is, Dell Technologies delivers modern, simple, resilient multi-cloud data protection that's secure by design. Not to mention cyber recovery with immutability, isolation, and intelligence. That sure sounds great. We're headed there now. Hop in! Yay! I should have been more specific, right? You should have been more specific. We're back with Daniel Newman, who's a top industry analyst. He's also the CEO of the Futurum Group, a very rapidly growing research firm. Hello, my friend. Thanks for joining the program. Great to see you. Uh, Dave, always good to go on theCUBE. All right, let's get right into it. Um, I want to share, Daniel, some recent uh, data from SurveyHouse ETR, which confirms what everybody's been talking about, and that is security, of course, we know is the number one priority for technology organizations. This survey specifically identifies zero trust, which seems to have gone from buzzword, you remember, Daniel, pre-pandemic, and now it's become this kind of mandate. How do you see zero trust? Is, is it going mainstream in your view? And what's driving that? Yeah, first of all, Dave, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that particular uh, notion about uh, technology and security being in vogue as the line item for IT has been protected during this uh, economic challenging period that we're in right now. The investment in security is actually going up. And that's something that I saw and had predicted as we sort of saw the economy turn. I mean, zero trust is really all about the way, uh, it's not just a technology, it's really a culture. It's about an end-to-end -end approach to security that really looks at hardware, software, and people, and, and considers that first and foremost, we need to sort of not really trust that anybody is as secure as they need to be. As the attackers get more innovative, it means that the traditional you know, perimeter-based security that we've used, it's not sufficient. We saw recent uh, legislation and strategy coming out of the Biden-Harris uh, administration. And, and actually, zero trust is one of the things they've focused on for federal and public sector. We're seeing it in government. We're seeing it in enterprise. Um, this is a really big thing. And, and you know, as, as I said, Dave, and, and probably the most important thing is it's all about end-to-end -end cyber across the IT stack. And for example, when you hear companies like Intel talk about TXT, or you hear about uh, Broadcom, when they talk about, you know, root of trust capabilities, in their NICs, really what they're talking about is hardware to software to humans, putting that right technology in there that enables end to end. Um, and that's why companies are picking certain hardware to go into certain devices. It's a really good point. I mean, you're, you're right. It starts at the very lower layers of the stack all the way up through- Silicon to people. Yeah, yeah, people. Exactly, all the way up through culture. And, and you know, a CISO told me the other day, Daniel, I'd love to get your feedback on this. He said, part of the reason why we're going for zero trust is because when a project is ready to be delivered or an application or initiative, 
it, particularly around stuff that's going to drive revenue in this day and age, we don't have to go through as much friction to get the stamp of approval. And, and it just accelerates time to market. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's, that's true. I mean, I think companies right now are in a different juxtaposition. Before, when we were in this sort of wild, frothy growth period of time that you and I have had many conversations about over the years, Dave, uh, it was all about spending for growth. It was growing infrastructure to get more customers, be able to deliver more services, et cetera. But now when we're seeing companies sort of reconfigure for what will be the next wave of growth, they need to make sure that their data is protected. They need to make sure that data is going to be available and that their systems are going to be up and working. As we see digital transformation enabling companies to actually deliver and grow they can't not put security at the top of their priority list. You have to be secure. And if your data cannot be backed up, you also open a whole lot of risk to things like ransomware, because that's what the that's what the black hats, that's what the people that are trying to get into your systems know is if you can't bring your system back up quickly, the vulnerabilities are really substantial. So I want, I want to ask you about data protection because the series, of course, the program we're running is around data protection. And what role do you see data protection, you know, specifically we're talking about backup and, and recovery. What role does that play as an adjacency to cybersecurity or, or, or even as a key component of a zero trust architecture? Yeah, I think there's a really significant interdependence. Uh, and that was kind of what I was alluding to just before this was if a company's backup is vulnerable, meaning if that data protection is not in place, or if the, uh, you know, if a hacker is able to get access to that backup, then the whole system becomes more at risk. Because the one thing is if a company knows it can bring its system back up, it's less likely to potentially pay out a ransomware request. So data protection just in that way creates a, a ton of risk. And, and so, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, new capabilities related to data protection, whether that's role-based, whether that's multi-factor authentication, uh, multi-person, two-person concurrence, uh, these are all things that are be done, being done along with, uh, you know, gapping, um, data vaulting. These are all strategies. And these are things my team at Future Group have looked at really closely as some of the key ways that companies are going to be able to defend, but not being able to back up and bring up systems quickly creates vulnerabilities and risks that companies really shouldn't be allowing themselves to be in such a position. Yeah, and there's no silver bullet to your point. There's just a lot of different strategies that organizations have to employ. And Daniel, I got to say, the last 110 days or so with the AI trend has just been amazing. So I want to ask you about technology trends that are impacting security. But before we get to the generative AI, I, let me just sort of list a couple that are top of mind. Cloud and multi-cloud, when, you, when you're doing cross-cloud, it creates other complexities hybrid work, remote work, we've talked about that a lot and the impact on cyber and of course AI, ML, generative AI, GPT. How do you see tech and today's tech trends impacting cybersecurity? Yeah, maybe I'll take that uh, a bit one by one because I, my natural gravity would be talk just about generative AI because it's so in vogue right now. But we, you know, to your point, multi-cloud for instance is a important operating model. Um, you know, companies that are going to obviously from prem to hybrid to multi are introducing a number of new security vulnerabilities. There's different API access. There's different uh, remote uh, security connectivity. You have different user access and multi tenancies, and of course, the risk of unsecure devices. You know, um, and by the way, hyperscalers, whether it's uh, GCP, AWS, or Azure, for instance, they all have different administration. So what your team may be extremely good at hardening for one, they may not have the capabilities or be as uh, up to speed on another, and that creates all kinds of risks. So when you work across multiple clouds uh, and prem, and as we know, I know I think you like to talk about the super cloud, Dave, but as you work across these multiple clouds that are really creating the enterprise fabric, this creates a whole bunch of new complexities. It would be like having five, 10 different prems with different hardware and different software running on them. And that's what enterprise IT uh, leaders and CISOs are being expected to defend, defend uh, for. Right, okay, so you're Get right. I, I do Get like to talk about super cloud because it is, the, it is a metaphor for consistency across clouds. What about yeah. generative AI? I yeah. mean, it's the hottest topic going. How do you see that? As yeah, I had to take a breath. I, want, I wanted to let you get in there. Yeah, thank um, you. 
Look, generative AI is probably one of the fastest and most disruptive trends that I've ever seen. I think you and I could both agree that something like 12 to 16 weeks ago, it was like, you know, it was a twinkle in our eye. We understood AI directionally was going to move to be much more uh, super self-supervising, deep reinforced learning with less and less human in the loop in order to do more and more things. I think the idea, though, that it's so quickly become pervasive and it's being utilized uh, in ways that are driving all kinds of productivity gains that are giving you access to data. It's very exciting. Having said that, it's also creating new security risks. You got employees of companies. Uh, we heard about this uh, last week. I believe it was Samsung uploading uh, proprietary or, or, or confidential data to chat GPT for synthesizing or utilization for, for content. I mean, think about how people that are going to try to use these tools are going to be feeding this data into systems where things like privacy and safety and security aren't even being considered. Talk about a risk for zero trust. I mean, these are major risks. And of course, you got to figure the black hats and the hackers are going to be using this to create all kinds of new creative ways to do better phishing, to do better uh, spear phishing attacks. These types of technologies, anytime they're used for good and positive, you can be absolutely certain they're going to be used on the other side for those that are trying to take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah, the cultural awareness becomes even more important. It's definitely moved from the boardroom to the rest of the organization. And now we, you know, we think we got it. That we we when we see a phishing attack, oh, I got this. It's spam. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, let, let me ask you a question. I mean, it seems like every year we look back and it's like record spending on cybersecurity, I don't know, 80, 100 you know, billion dollars and it's growing, but the threat keeps escalating. Bad guys, they're highly capable. They're, the adversaries, they're motivated because there's big dollars there. How do you see CISOs dealing with that moving target? Yeah, we see several trends. And you know, I even spoke to our, our team that, that leads the data protection practice. One of the trends that they really brought to my attention um, was the collaboration and, and the collaboration that needs to take place both in enterprises and across ecosystems. So touching on, on within the enterprise, you're seeing CISOs you know, much more now involved in data storage and data protection uh, decisions. It used to be something that was more made at the IT level. Um, and as we see end-to-end -end security and zero trust becoming more priority, the CISO is being brought in. And that brings another collaboration I think is really important. And that collaboration is ecosystem with vendor partners. Um, that's between the enterprise and the vendor and then vendors themselves. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, the zero, uh, the root of trust at Broadcom. And then of course, you know, Dell has shown some preference in their power edge servers for the Broadcom NICs. And that's because there's a collaboration going on between the OEM, between the component maker. And that of course ends up being something that integrates all the way down to the enterprise where they're getting the best technology hardened for both the hardware, software, and as you and I have kind of alluded to throughout this conversation into the culture. Um, also, we see continued investment. As we mentioned, I think at the top of the show, Dave, um, you know, IT spend is sort of seeing a shift. More spend is going towards security. Companies need to secure their environments. They need to know that they have their customers' data and all their other critical data, that it's available, and that it's obviously going to be able to brought, be brought back in the event of an emergency so that investment needs to be made and it needs to be made to try to get ahead of more of these risks because right now, you know, security has too long been reactive. So by having those collaborations, working with the ecosystem, and then of course, uh, you know, being more proactive and in investing to reduce risk of threat, those are the things that are going to be done that are going to hopefully help CISO start to solve a problem that, by the way, that will be continuous, will be pervasive, and will never go away completely. Yeah, and great, great comments. And of course, the generative AI, the hackers are going to have it. But one of the things that GPT is good for is ideation. So maybe it can help us be more proactive. Um, last question. When you think about the increasing sophistication, the frequency of, of cyber threats and cyber attacks, do you think organizations will really integrate backup and recovery solutions as a core component of their zero trust? security strategies. What are your thoughts on how viable that strategy is to improving overall cyber resiliency? Yeah, if you're familiar with the NIST Zero Trust Framework, the protection of critical data assets is actually a pretty important part and it's specifically called out. And so that sort of gives us a de facto answer of yes. Um, I think the relationship is symbiotic between data and security right now. And I expect that, you know, being able to deal with uh, and recover critical assets quickly um, is going to be a, a really core part of zero trust. Now, obviously zero trust is, you know, like we said in the beginning, it's treating everything like there's a risk, everything like it could fail. 
But we do know, Dave, that no matter what ends up happening, there will be malicious attacks. There will be, um, you know, there will be parameters that will be compromised. And that can be, that can happen to some of the best CISOs and CIOs in the world with the most sophisticated uh, cybersecurity. So it's all about making those investments. It's about, you know, investing upfront, investing consistently, and of course, building that culture where security is laid into it from the very onset, from every worker in the company that basically touches the IT. So put into a really short sort of thought, you know, security needs to be addressed everywhere in the IT stack, uh, from the silicon layer to the human layer, on hardware and on software. And of course, everyone who touches enterprise IT needs to be part of a zero trust environment. Data protection has to be part of it. I don't see any other way. Daniel, as always, awesome comments. You're such a clear thinker. I really appreciate you coming on the program. Great to be here, Dave. See you soon. All right, keep it right there. We'll be back right after this short break. Every day, it seems there's a new headline about the devastating financial impacts or trust that's lost due to ransomware or other sophisticated cyber attacks. But with our help, Dell Technologies customers are taking action by becoming more cyber resilient and deterring attacks so they can greet students daily with a smile. They're ensuring that a range of essential government services remain available 24-7 to citizens wherever they're needed. From swiftly dispatching public safety personnel or sending an inspector to sign off on a homeowner's dream, to protecting, restoring, and sustaining our precious natural resources for future generations. With ever-changing cyber attacks targeting organizations in every industry, our cyber resiliency solutions are right on the money, providing the security and controls you need. We help customers protect and isolate critical data from ransomware and other cyber threats, delivering the highest data integrity to keep your doors open, and ensuring that hospitals and healthcare providers have access to the data they need, so patients get life-saving treatment without fail. If a cyber incident does occur, our intelligence, analytics, and responsive team are in a class by themselves, helping you reliably recover your data and applications so you can quickly get your organization back up and running. With Dell Technologies behind you, you can stay ahead of cybercrime, safeguarding your business and your customers' vital information. Learn more about how Dell Technologies cyber resiliency solutions can provide true peace of mind for you. Okay, we're back with Jim Shook, who is the Director of the Cybersecurity and Compliance Practice at Dell Technologies. Jim, good to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Dave, thank you. Delighted to be here in person with you. Yeah, it's great to be in studio. We always have a better conversation, right? So for our audience, Jim is someone who spends an enormous amount of time with customers. So we're going to dig into what's changed in the conversations, and in particular, who are the decision makers these days regarding cybersecurity and data protection versus in the past. So Jim, what about it? What's changed? Who's, in, who's driving the bus these days? Yeah, I've, I've had a good perspective on this, Dave, because I've been talking to our customers now about cyber resilience and recovery from ransomware destruction for eight years. And we've really evolved the conversation over that time. One of the things I've seen that I think is really important is we've, we've moved from having just say IT and infrastructure at the table to talk about these things. We added along the way the cybersecurity took an interest, obviously. Um, we get risk and compliance from time to time, but even legal will get involved. Now it's a lot of seats at the table are taken by people who are focused on the business. Sometimes it's the C-suite, sometimes it's heads of business lines, but that's been a really important development. And audit too, right? Audit in, in some cases from a, a process standpoint is like the last line of defense, actually backup and recovery is the last line of defense. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but as you, as you point out, and I'll share with the audience, I've observed, and I think most people understand this, exactly what Jim was saying, that cyber was once the domain of IT and the SecOps team, and then it became a boardroom issue. And it now feels as though it's organization wide. And, and Jim, has cybersecurity in, in your mind, you know, gone mainstream? And if so, why is that? It definitely, definitely has, especially over that same time frame. We get more and more digitally oriented over time. And so businesses have realized that they, they are digital. And so cybersecurity 
cyber attacks are a threat to the business just as any other threat would have been before cyber really came along and became an issue. So if you're not protecting against those threats and have the ability to be resilient to them, you're not protecting your business. And it's everybody's job to do that. I think it's really interesting that the business has become more involved and that's also evolved the conversation to focus more on outcomes. What happens? How can we return to business and how much time versus say, let's buy the next shiny toy or have a cyber control that does this. It's more focusing on the business outcome. It seems like there was a change, you know, when the when the board started to get involved, it was almost like prior to that, it's kind of early last decade, let's say, it was like this, there was a mentality of failure equals fire. So a lot of times people were like, oh, I'll talk about that. And we saw that change where, you know, folks who understand cyber would come to the board and say, no, you are going to get attacked. You are going to get infiltrated. It's going to happen. So it's, it's all about that response and you got to be transparent. Do you agree with that, that that sort of failure equals fire mentality has changed and there's now much more transparency and that's part of the sort of mainstream awareness? Yeah, clearly. And it's been a really good development. It, it used to be a lot of times cyber security teams would not get involved in these conversations because their thought was, well, if we're having a recovery conversation, if we're working on being more resilient, we failed at our job. They've realized that's not the case. The attackers are going to be successful sometimes. And part of a good cyber practice is the resilience and the ability to recover if those attacks are successful. Hmm. Now, Jim is a lawyer. So, and there's an intersection going on at the board level between cybersecurity and, and legal issues. So Jim, we want to understand that from your, you know, put on your legal hat for a second. What's that board discussion like these days? It's really interesting. The board is aware that these are risks to the business, so they have to become more involved. There's regulatory pressure. The SEC has been looking at new rules that might come out this month, they might come out in the fall, that's going to require the board to take more interest and have more expertise in these, in these areas. There's just risk to the business, and that's always what one of the things that the board has focused on. And I'll give you a really good example where the board's getting more involved. It's in the idea of having to pay a ransom. So a lot of times I would hear from customers, well, we're not worried about this problem. Worst case, we'll just pay the ransom. Right. Why not? Yeah. And they don't understand. Sometimes there is no ransom to pay. Sometimes it takes longer to recover if you have the ransom. But from the board perspective, I think where they got interested is there are some laws that will prevent you from paying a ransom depending on who gets the money. So those get really complex. It's very difficult to tell who's going to get the money. So you may make a payment and then get in trouble later on, even though you've been diligent with your process. That's high risk. And so the better outcome is to not have to pay the ransom. It's to be prepared to recover. Oh, clearly, but I got to ask you. So you're saying it's, it's, it's illegal because not necessarily to pay a ransom, but it's illegal to what? Pay a, a, a felon? Yeah, there, there are laws on the books um, in the financial uh, industry that say you can't do business with certain restricted nat uh, nationals or geographical areas. So North Korea is a really good example of that. If you do business with them and paying a ransom to them would be doing business with them, you violated those laws. Yeah, this is where you definitely need somebody who understands the law to figure this stuff out. All right, let's talk about misconceptions. What are the most common misconceptions that you see in cybersecurity that, that people really need to understand? I think I still see a lot of the same ones, but fortunately we've all learned along the way and I don't see them quite as frequently. A big one is that the thought that we've already invested in disaster recovery and that's going to cover us for a cyber recovery situation. And that's just not the case. The technologies that you have for outages and natural disasters are still as important as they ever were. Think about backup, think about replication, even continuous data protection. They're not going to help you very much in a what we would call severe but plausible cyber disruption. So you have to look at those things separately. You're not, you, you spend a lot of money and time, it's just not gonna help you that much in those types of disruptions. What about the cloud? I mean, a lot of people think, well, I got my data in the cloud. Those guys have awesome security, which they do, by the way. They um, do. But does the cloud solve my problem? Do I have to not worry about it if it, my data is in the cloud? I, I think there's still- We're laughing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. There's still some misconceptions out there. And, and if you think about in the cloud, the shared responsibility model, your cloud provider or your SaaS provider, or whoever you're working with covers certain things, but you maintain responsibility for other things. 
And if you're not understanding where that point is, what is your responsibility, you're going to be in trouble. Ultimately, and I've heard this a lot from regulators, they don't care who you use as a partner, who you use for a cloud provider, it's on you to make sure that things work properly. Jim, are there any other misconceptions that you want people to know about? Yeah, there's a few that come to mind pretty quickly that I'm hearing frequently. Uh, one is, we're not a target, we don't need to worry about this. And I think that totally misunderst misunderstands the landscape. Everybody's a target. You think about attacks like NotPetya, a lot of organizations were not focused on the target, but were collateral damage because sometimes malware does unexpected things. And really anybody who has a presence on the internet, the bad actors many times look for just a vulnerability that's out there. And if they can find it, they'll leverage it. They're not looking to see who has the vulnerability, just somebody has it, I get in, I lock up their data, I demand money. They're knocking on doors and it, it's automated. The doors open, I'm going in. And if I get something out of it, great. If not, I'll move on. That's exactly. Another one is we have cyber insurance. And cyber insurance is definitely a component of an overall risk strategy. You help to transfer some of the risk, but it's not the strategy. You have to be secure. In fact, in today's world, if you don't have good cybersecurity, you may not be able to get a cyber policy at all. And in any case, an attack is always going to have costs related to it. There are going to be exclusions in insurance policies. You know, ultimately, an insurance policy is just a contract and the terms of that contract control. There's no such thing as cyber insurance and everybody gets it. It's what you negotiate with the provider. That's a big one. I heard Warren Buffett on TV the other day, you know, they, they you know, Berkshire owns uh, 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 Geico saying, they're now going to six, every six months they change the policy. He'd love to go to a month. So, wow. you know, you're exposed. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a key component. And the third one is kind of along similar lines, but it's, it's a technical side of it. We have turned on immutability on our storage platform. And that's a great control. We talk about that a lot in our data protection portfolio with our data domain, turn on that retention lock, but it's not the destination. It's really a first step. It will make you much more resilient but there's a lot of other things that you have to do to really build that resilience. Tell us why customers should trust Dell for their you know, cybersecurity strategy generally, but you, know, you guys obviously were talking data protection and backup and recovery, why Dell? I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, we, we have a big practice group. So my group alone, eight years that we've, uh, since we founded it, just out there to help customers understand and, and deal with these problems. That kind of fits into the whole idea of Dell's global scale and skill. We're, we're everywhere, we have a lot of expertise. We have a, certainly a wide range of, of offerings, uh, best in class among compute to storage to the things that we do in the cloud with the hyperscalers, our partners, our consulting, all of those things really tied together. And Dave, those are becoming more important because a lot of customers are working on their cyber strategy, which includes a component of managing and the risk from their third-party service providers. So as part of that, Number one, they have to vet their partners. And number two, many of them are scaling back. They don't want to have 200, 300 people that they do business with. And so our ability to have those offerings, to have all that global scale and skill is important. And then when they dive deeper and they have to make sure that their partners are doing the right things to protect them, the things that we do with secure development lifecycle, things that we do with the secure supply chain are really powerful. We don't talk about those enough. We're starting to talk about them more and surfacing those for our customers so that they understand what we're doing in that space. Yeah. All right, Jim, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Dave. Okay, in a moment, I'll be back to share some new information about data protection and its relationship to a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy. Keep it right there. We heard today that the challenges of securing your enterprise have never been more acute. And hopefully we gave a perspective as to why this is and some of the ways organizations are thinking about mitigating risk. 
One of the key points we heard from our guests generally and confirmed specifically by analyst Daniel Newman is that you have to think in system terms where an end-to-end -end view of your security regime is considered holistically from the software supply chain to the silicon root of trust to the hardware and software infrastructure all the way up through the value chain of products and services in your organization and then back out to your ecosystem. We also heard how backup and recovery processes have to be there if all else fails. But even that is evolving where new capabilities like immutability and air gapping and the cloud become considerations that really weren't top of mind five years ago. Today, they are fundamental. We hope you've enjoyed this first in our three-part series, Navigating the Road to Cyber Resiliency, made possible by Dell Technologies. Everything here will be on demand at thecube.net. SiliconAngle.com has all the news, and you want to check out the security section of the site, where a team of writers and journalists and analysts, including myself, Rob Hof, Paul Gillen, Duncan Riley, Maria Deutscher, Kristen Martin, Mark Albertson, and our newest journalist, David Strom, we post news, analysis, and in-depth features regularly. Now, to learn more about Dell's data protection and cyber recovery solutions, visit dell.com slash data protection. This is Dave Vellante, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the road on your journey to cyber resiliency.